Um, <laughs> with no further ado, good afternoon. I'm Susan Collins, a Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy and delighted to see all of you here with us this afternoon. Um, really have been looking forward to what promises to be a terrific policy talks on the future of education policy in the United States, a really important topic. So before we begin, I'd like to thank the Education Policy Initiative, which is co-hosting today's event, and also the Harry A. and Margaret T. Towsley Foundation for making today's event possible. Um, that's really very important for all of us. I want to particularly acknowledge Don and Judy Rummelhart and Lynn and Stuart White, who are here um, with us today. And Lynn and Judy, we are so appreciative of all of the support that your family has provided to us over the years and are really grateful that you're able to join us for today's event. So welcome. Um, so named for their parents, the Harry A. and Margaret D. Towsley Foundation Policymaker in Residence program was established here at the Ford School in 2002. And the goal of that program is to bring individuals with significant policymaking experience here to the Ford School to engage with students and faculty and with um, people throughout the University of Michigan. And this year, the Ford School is really honored to have James Qual as this year's Towsley Foundation Policymaker in Residence. Prior to joining the Ford School, James served as special assistant to President Obama and deputy director of the White House Domestic Policy Council. He's a graduate of Stanford University and Harvard Law School and previously served as deputy undersecretary at the US Department of Education, as well as special assistant to the president for economic policy. And there he helped shape policy development on higher education, student financial aid, and labor markets. And he's also served in positions in the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the Clinton White House. Well, while at the Ford School, James has participated in a large number of activities, and he's teaching two courses for us, one on US higher education system, and the other on the policymaking process and implementation of healthcare reform. He's also developed quite a fan club here um, among public policy and education students. And uh, I see a number of students in our audience here. And uh, I just wanted to say that I know many of them are here not just because of extra credit, but for a variety of other reasons as well. So um, today, in the midst of really a major shift in the political landscape, um, James has assembled a panel of experts to address the future of early education, K-12, and higher education policies in the United States. He'll introduce our distinguished panelists more fully in just a moment, and there are also bios in your programs. Um, and so for now, I'd just like to offer a very warm Ford School welcome to Alex Nock, David Cleary, and Deborah Ball. We're delighted to have you here with us this afternoon. So before I turn things over to James, I'd like to remind our audience that if you have a question, um, please write it on one of the cards that you should have received as you came into the auditorium this afternoon. Ford School volunteers will begin collecting cards at around 4.30, so you can pass them to the ends of the aisles. And with help from Sarah Cannon, one of our postdoctoral fellows at EPI, and two of James' students, Joe Shea and Anna Strisich, um, they will help to read your questions and facilitate the Q&A session. If you're watching online, please tweet in your questions to us using the hashtag policy talks. And so, James, I'm delighted to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Dean Collins, for that uh, wonderful introduction and for making me feel so welcome here. I also want to thank uh, the Towsley family, my students, my colleagues here. It's been uh, a wonderful um, fall for me. Uh, usually, we think of elections as settling questions about the source, uh, the direction of uh, government. And this year maybe is a little more different in that the election results raise more questions than they answered. And I think that's true for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, Donald Trump was elected by a coalition that's a little bit different than the typical Republican coalition. He was elected by a populist conservative coalition. And so it will be interesting to see if there are uh, places in which he pursues policies that are different from those favored by uh, most Republicans and by Republican in Congress. Uh, secondly, generally, new presidents are committed to carrying out their policy platforms as articulated in the campaign. Uh, but in this case, uh, the president-elect seems uh, 
uncommitted to some of the specifics in his policies, and there have been uh, you know, numerous news reports in recent days about uh, the, the president-elect or his advisors walking back some of the specifics of his uh, campaign proposals. And third, and perhaps most importantly, it is not really clear where these decisions are going to be made. Uh, the ideological makeup of uh, the president's senior advisors and the cabinet uh, is still in question as he tries to grow beyond uh, the core group that advised him during a campaign. And although he badly needs, uh, in my opinion, uh, help from more professional, long-time uh, uh, Republicans experienced in governing, the chaos around his organization has uh, made it difficult to bring those types of advisors in. Uh, some people think that uh, in this administration, the substantive agenda will be driven more by Congress uh, than by the administration. So uh, it's really not clear uh, what types of people will be making uh, these decisions or even where they'll be sitting. Uh, all this uncertainty is also happening at a very interesting time in education policy in the area of uh, elementary and secondary education. We passed an important piece of legislation a year ago uh, that reforming the No Child Left Behind Act that moved a lot of authority around decisions for school accountability uh, and standardized testing uh, back to the states. So there's unanswered questions around what states will do with this additional flexibility and to what extent the federal government should erect so-called guardrails around the degree of choices that, uh, that they'll have. Uh, the issues of college costs and student debt have perhaps never been more salient and for the first time in my memory were often near the very top of the list of voters' uh, policy concerns. And Finally, the election itself was in some ways a reaction to frustration over stagnant living standards that many Americans have seen uh, for several decades now. And while education policy is not likely to be the only uh, solution to those problems, it's hard to imagine addressing those problems without a sustained effort to help more people get uh, more and better education. So with all of those questions in mind, we're fortunate to have uh, such an excellent panel here today to help us wade through these. And here on the panel, uh, starting from closest to me, is Deborah Ball, who is one of the nation's leading uh, education researchers. She is the William H. Payne Collegiate Professor of Education here at the University of Michigan and an Arthur Thurnau Professor. She just completed 11 years as Dean at the UM School of Education last summer. She serves on the board of the National Science Foundation. She is the president-elect of the American Educational Research Association, and she is the director of Teaching Works, which is a new project to develop comprehensive professional training for new teachers, uh, both before they start and in their first three years of service. She taught elementary school for more than 15 years and continues to teach math uh, to elementary students in the summer. Uh, next to Deborah is Alex Nock. Alex is uh, perhaps the textbook definition of a Washington insider on education policy. Uh, he also was born here in Ann Arbor, uh, so he is a Wolverine uh, through and through. He is the co-founder and principal at the Penn Hill Group, which is an education policy uh, consulting firm in Washington. Prior to that, he served for 15 years on the Democratic staff of the House Education Committee ultimately serving as deputy staff director during student loan reform uh, in the first two years of the Obama administration. And he's worked on uh, virtually every important piece of education legislation in that time, including the Higher Education Act, the Workforce Investment Act, uh, the Individual Disabilities uh, Education Act, and, and many more. His advice on education policy and legislative strategy is widely listened to in Washington. And then finally on my far left is David Cleary. David is likely to be one of the most influential people in Washington on education policy over the next couple of years. He is the chief of staff uh, to Senator Lamar Alexander and the staff director uh, for the committee that Senator Alexander chairs, the Senate uh, Help Committee, which governs education issues. Uh, Senator Alexander has all, is known as one of the most effective legislators in the Senate, and he was also a Secretary of Education and the President of the University of Tennessee. Uh, David has worked closely with Senator Alexander for more than a decade uh, and started his career uh, as a career uh, uh, civil servant at the Department of Education. So uh, with all of that, 
I wanted to start with a question uh, for Deborah, and that is, you know, over the last 20 to 25 years, uh, we've had a single strategy for improving our schools, our K-12 schools, and that's centered around uh, defining standards for what students should learn and trying to hold schools and teachers accountable for that. I know we have, you know, as states are looking to make changes to their accountability regimes and our schools get uh, increasingly diverse, both racially and economically, it, you know, what is the legacy of standards-based reform and is that the strategy our nation ought to continue to pursue? Yeah, um, thank you, James. And I'm really very honored to be here on this panel. Um, I think it's a good question because the strategy that the United States has been using from the federal perspective to try to improve um, what young people in this country learn has been pretty consistently similar, even though it's had different names. It's involved, as you said very well, setting academic standards, named different things different in different decades, and um, installing testing regimes of one kind or another. Um, so it's kind of a name where you're supposed to be and then test to see if we get there, and pretty much consistently neglects what it would take to actually get to young people in a way that would change what they're having opportunities to learn. And so in many ways, um, inequality is uh, in, in, in the main not being reduced, in fact being increased. And the things that we don't tend to know how to do something about is what happens inside of classrooms. And so we keep trying to pull levers that we imagine um, will affect classrooms, but don't. And earlier than that, before the era of standards-based reform, and it has shown up in shadows during this period, are curriculum reforms. So not just standards, but the building of materials. So in the 1990s, there was a large investment by the National Science Foundation in uh, mathematics uh, curriculum materials in the hopes of changing the math curriculum. But we had seen that before, too, in the 1960s. So Whatever we do, we seem to manage the problem of local control and the large scale of our country by pulling levers that don't actually get all the way inside the classroom. And then what we get is enormous variability and the reproduction of inequality. I mean, that's the simplest way I can answer that. But I think your question is very well posed. Can we, can we find a strategy that takes advantage of what we understand about what it takes to change what goes on inside of classrooms that students actually have chances to learn? So, David, you were one of the primary authors of the legislation amending No Child Left Behind Act last year. I wondered what you thought were the proper roles for the federal government in this, and for states in trying to answer the direction of school reform, and uh, what, if anything, you're hoping that states will accomplish with the greater flexibility that they have now. Sure. Well, thanks for the opportunity to be here. The, um, the Every Student Succeeds Act was the result of you know, seven years of Congress trying to figure out a path away from No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind passed in 2001. It was a big, broad, bipartisan bill. Everybody loved it for about two years. Um, and then the, kind of the realities of the accountability system set up in, in No Child Left Behind started to come into play. And the, from our perspective, kind of the unthinking, top-down structure of how to identify a school and what to do about a school started to, to hurt states and, and local school boards and, and schools in trying to figure out how to fix what was going wrong. Kind of what, what she was saying about the, we, we pull these levers in Washington, but it doesn't really fix the, the solution in, in the classroom. So kind of after, after a long period of malaise on how to fix No Child Left Behind, we, we worked with Patty Murray and uh, Bobby Scott and, and John Klein. And the consensus that we reached was to kind of keep the standards, states pick them, not a, a federal standard, um, but keep the, and keep the federal tests so that we have some transparency in data and making sure that we're not leaving groups behind or if, we, if groups aren't performing well, that we can identify where to solve it. But instead of kind of a Washington-based identification system and uh, sanction system, turn that back to the states and say to the states, have the tests, you figure out what to do with it. You figure out how to intervene in schools, where to intervene, when to intervene, and move away from kind of the Washington-based No Child Left Behind and, and the, the waivers from Secretary Duncan, which kind of controlled how to fix a school, and really restore a lot of that to the, to the local school boards, uh, trying to figure out how to fix that. Um, so I think that's kind of our, our general operating premise, is have standards, have tests, report regularly to, to parents and teachers and the public, but then when you identify schools that are not doing very well, you, you need to figure out what interventions you're gonna do to try to fix it. 
So Alex, one of the things that the Obama administration has tried to do in the year since the law passed is set in place some rules or, uh, uh, provide some boundaries to what states can do with the additional flexibility. You know, do you think, what is at stake in those rules? Are those rules likely to survive in the Trump administration? And, you know, what does that mean for our schools? I, I mean, the, uh, certainly the Obama administration, you know, had a goal with their regulatory efforts to uh, help further define uh, kind of their view on what Congress intended with the Every Student Succeeds Act. I mean, I, I think the short answer on whether or not some of those regulatory initiatives will survive or probably not. Um, you know, you, you have a situation where um, there is, uh, even on some of the regulations proposed in the, in the K-12 arena, um, by the Obama administration, probably bipartisan support to kind of get rid of some of them. Uh, I think the question then is going to become is, you know, how does a, a Trump administration react to either state questions or state policy decisions around it? Um, but certainly, you know, what I think the Obama administration was trying to do, which was essentially was further their goals and further kind of the goals they view as what Congress had intended in terms of trying to pass uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act, whether it be around accountability, whether it be around, uh, you know, the kind of quality of assessments that are out there and the standards that states had. Um, they are running into a little bit of a political buzzsaw, though, in terms of what happened with the election, which you kind of mentioned earlier. So. Uh, David, I wanted to go back to you. One of Mr. Trump's most prominent education proposals on the campaign trail was a $20 billion proposal to create school choice, including private school vouchers. Is that something that you think Congress is likely to entertain in the near term, or is that likely to be you know, more aspirational uh, or something that Congress will take up you know, sometime in the, in the not quite so foreseeable future? I think for as a matter of legislation, it's likely to be more aspirational. Uh, it's, the president-elect's uh, pro proposal was modeled after legislation that Senator Alexander had introduced and we voted on in the Senate, um, and we didn't get 50 votes, And even though, even though we had a Republican majority. There are, um, from our perspective, unfortunately, a, a fair number of Republican senators that don't support that type of a program or don't currently support. Maybe they'll change their mind with a president that's favorable to it. But the, the, the hill is pretty steep to climb to get to, to, get to a majority. Then to, in the Senate, you need to get to 60. So it's a, even, even steeper. But I think there are things that the administration could do um, outside of legislation to promote it, to promote school choice, to advance school choice. Um, you, you know, the bully pulpit is a very powerful thing. Um, you know, thinking back to Bill Bennett when he was Secretary of Education, went to Chicago and declared it to be the worst school district in the in the country, and that spurred Chicago to say, "Holy heck, what's going on?" and make some change. So, if you have a, a Secretary of Education, a president um, running around the country saying school choice is a, is a solution to a, a lot of the problems that we see in schools, um, you can create more opportunities for for local choice, for state choice, for um, experiments like the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. So I think we're, we're more likely to see those types of solutions instead of a, an actual accomplishment. We, we'd, we would, Lamar would love to see one um, pass, the, pass the Senate, but there's a lot of votes to count between now and then. Okay. Deborah, uh, another flashpoint in the Obama administration's policies has been its effort to promote um, a specific regime of teacher evaluation and, and to connect, connecting teacher compensation to how well students perform on standardized tests. Uh, it, it seems as if the pendulum is swinging away from that policy. On the other hand, we uh, read in a paper this morning that uh, President-elect Trump met with Michelle Rhee, and she brought up the, uh, the, the, the possibility of teacher merit pay as an issue she would like to see the Trump administration pursue. You know, what do you see, you know, what do you think of the merits of these policies, and what do you see as the landscape for them going forward? Well, I think many people know that Michigan, uh, as a state, worked to have a new educator evaluation policy four years ago, and that I was very involved in that. And one of the things we tried to do in Michigan was to take the imperative to build an evaluation system and focus it on improvement, which is not the way most of the educator evaluation systems were built. They were mostly built to be punitive on the assumption that most teachers would do the right job if somebody held a stick over them and that they're just refraining from doing the right job. And teacher merit pay is a similar strategy. It seems to suggest that the reason teachers aren't teaching better is because they're not paid enough. 
or that someone isn't looking over their shoulders, when it completely overlooks the fact that teaching is an incredibly complicated thing to do well, particularly in the face of the incredible diversity of our nation and the ambitious standards that we just talked about. And so educator evaluation is, a, is somewhat similar to standard-based reform for K-12 children in that it sets out some level of performance and then punishes or rewards if you hit it. Mm -hmm. So once again, rather than thinking about how you could improve the quality of teaching, we find ways to move around it. And you know, you can't imagine doing that in any other sector. I mean, I could give foolish and maybe not so foolish examples. Imagine if we, and nobody likes these comparisons, imagine if we tried to improve healthcare by setting standards for what it looks like when a patient is healthy and then uh, asked patients afterwards or measured whether they were healthy and didn't worry about the preparation of healthcare professionals. Be very odd. We wouldn't expect anything <coughs> to happen, but we wouldn't expect that to happen, you know, with flying planes or any other occupation. We always worry about the safety of the clients and the skill of the people who do that work. But somehow in education, we manage to try to do everything that works around the actual people who help students mm. learn, other than either get close to them and punish them and reward them or do things about what they're supposed to manipulate. So until we have a strategy that actually builds, takes responsibility for the quality of teaching, I'm not that sanguine that we're likely to see very much that can improve the quality of what kids have opportunities to learn mm. in this country. Can I jump in on that? Yeah. I, I think Professor Ross is right. I think that it, it's really hard to do it well and to do it right. I think you know Lamar would call it the holy grail of education reform. If we can find ways to pay teachers more for teaching well uh, in that is fair and 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 justifiable and valid and reliable, I think that it'd be, it could be very transformative for education, but it, it has often been used as a punitive way to punish teachers or kind of an unthinking way to just give kind of the same amount of money to a couple teachers that you know kind of won the, the genetic lottery in the classroom. I guess, so, can I ask you a question about yeah. that? So he gave me permission to do that. Sure, <laughs> please do. Um, <laughs> How, how do you imagine, what's your theory of action that by which, by paying somebody more money, they will do better work? I understand the possibility that if someone is doing better work, you might choose to reward them, but as a strategy for improvement, how do you imagine, how do you, how do you trace that in your mind about how that would improve people's teaching? Well, I think it's, it's, it's the inverse of what you said. I think if, you, if they're teaching well, you pay them more to reward success. Right, but what we and need so is four million people to teach um, in ways that meet the needs of a very diverse student population, diverse in ways that we've never seen in this country. So I'm asking, how does it work as an improvement strategy, not as a reward strategy? I think I think all, I mean, I think human beings respond to incentives, right? And so I think that if if teachers see that there is a system that is fair and reliable, that rewards better performance that can help incentivize them to making sure that they stay up on <clears throat> on education pedagogy that they stay up on on things like that on uh, on curriculum improvements i think we have to make sure that we're looking at not just kind of the status of of a test but i think you look at growth and making sure that they're that they are responding to the population in their classroom so you reward them for that that you bring you know if students are really low on the test and then you bring them up high maybe they you know maybe they're making progress and that's something that you can reward I think it kind of depends on the robustness of what it is that you're looking at, and I, that's why it's so hard to do. So I think that we, you know, it's it it would be ill-advised to, as it was under the Obama administration, to kind of set a national policy that this is a thing, something that everybody has to do, and then states have to send in their their teacher evaluation system to the federal government to get approved, because it's it's too complex, it's too it's too difficult to do at a national level. I think, you know, the teacher incentive fund was created as a federal. Uh, competitive grant program to experiment with it and see what works and see what doesn't work and learn from it and and I think we do more of that instead of saying here's a federal policy that everybody has to do and which usually ends up punitive. Alex I want to ask you a teacher related question too which was um, you know last year before Justice Scalia passed away mm. uh, it appeared that the Supreme Court was going to make it uh, um, impossible for teacher unions to require teachers to pay dues to unions. And now that it appears that uh, President Trump will have the opportunity to fill that seat on the Supreme Court, is that a case that is likely to come back? And what would the implications of uh, right to work laws, nationwide right to work laws, have on teacher unions and education policy? Uh, I mean, uh, just one thing before I answer that. I'm sure what you were probably saying, too, that it's not the only kind of oh, mechanism no. to improve 
you know, it, it, it's one aspect of how you might improve teacher quality or teacher effectiveness to incentivize. I'm sure there are many, many more, which we could talk about as well. But in terms of um, the Supreme Court issue, yeah, that, that case could definitely come back. Um, and uh, if you're focused on kind of um, some of the other actually aspects that I think Deborah was getting at here about, um, you know, under what conditions do teachers work under, what supports do they have, what resources do they have, um, you know, the uh, everyday kind of um, experience of teachers will uh, dramatically, are, is dramatically different depending on where they teach and in what school district. Um, and ensuring that teachers have uh, collective bargaining rights and that unions are strong to be able to advocate uh, for uh, certain work protections and access to resources to be able to do their jobs is very important. Obviously, um, a Trump administration could, depending on who they select as a justice, you know, there have been very famous uh, justices selected by members of both <laughs> uh, political persuasions that turned out to be very different on a lot of issues. Uh, but that certainly could have some sort of chilling effect on the ability of unions to organize and therefore kind of represent workers in their ability to ensure they have the tools to do their job. How that impacts the national education conversation might be different, uh, but in terms of just workforce protections, yeah, absolutely, it could come back. So I wanna switch a little bit to higher education and one area that uh, the Obama administration worked on a lot was uh, for-profit colleges, and that industry is very differently situated now than it was eight years ago. On the day after the election, the stocks of a number of publicly traded for-profit colleges were up by uh, double digits. I wonder, David, what your view is about what the election means for for-profit colleges. Is the new administration likely to change course there? Sure, I, I would say probably absolutely. I think the the Obama administration has been very zealous, as you and I have talked about for a number of years, <laughs> um, about their prosecution of of the for profit sector. Um, in 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 some cases, with good cause, there have been some examples of some really bad uh, outcomes and results and and fraud. Um, but I think the the Trump administration is unlikely to pursue any of that. They'll um, you know, turn off the attorney general, they'll turn off the, the FTC, they'll turn off the CFPB, all of those things. And I think it'll turn back to Congress, which is probably where it should be, for, for Congress to try and figure out what to do about accountability in higher education writ large. The, you know, I think most of the, as I've said to you for years, the Republican concerns about gainful employment and all of that are, are not going after bad actors, but it's going after one sector just for the sake of going after that sector. So I think that you'll you'll see hopefully an opportunity for Congress to come together and try and figure out accountability in higher education that looks at all sectors fairly and, and equally and and tries to figure out what is it that we want out of an institution of higher education, what are the results, what are the, the inputs and the outputs, and and measure those fairly and then let the chips fall where they may. If 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 a fair system disproportionately falls on one sector, but the system underlying it is fair, I don't know that you'd get very many Republicans to be upset about it, but the perception and in many cases the reality is that what's been going on hasn't been fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to get in on that, Alex? Yeah, I just in the sense that I, I do wonder, you know, certainly I, I think I agree with David's baseline kind of prediction that it, it certainly won't be the same as an Obama or even a possible Clinton administration would have been with for-profit schools. I think that, uh, I, I don't know if I were a for-profit school, I would necessarily think though that the, you know, that there's no pressure on, that's gonna be on me or, or no kind of, kind of impact. I think to David's point, um, you know, there is an increasing interest in Congress you know, about looking at some of the outcomes of what all schools are producing, whether, you know, and different people have different opinions about what the outcome might be that you want to look at, whether it's default rates or earnings or loan repayment rates or uh, what percentage of your, um, this isn't really an outcome, but it's an input per se, but what percentage of, you know, students are in your, are, are institutions enrolling that are Pell Grant eligible or your graduation rates. And, you know, that if applied across, per David's point, across, you know, all types of schools will impact for profits, nonprofits, private nonprofits, uh, and I think that uh, I wouldn't necessarily. I think some people are uh, viewing the Trump election as kind of the end of an oversight 
mechanism. I wonder uh, if it's the beginning of a larger kind of effort to look at the impact of how institutions are doing on a number of metrics. I will say that on the for-profit side of things, the critics of that industry uh, are not gone from Congress, whether you have Senator Warren from Massachusetts, Dick Durbin from Illinois, um, and other senators, uh, I guess primarily in the Senate, Senate Democrats, not that there aren't House Democrats that uh, also speak to this issue. Those, are, those, uh, those members are still there and, and anxious to gain uh, kind of attention for their points of view. Mm -hmm. Deborah. I think it's kind of an elephant in the room that might be worth talking about. So you opened by asking me about standards-based reform, and pretty much everything we've been talking about is in one form or another some form of accountability or mm -hmm. rewards or mm -hmm. setting goals. And what I'm arguing is that that stays outside of practice and that if one wants to improve things for young people, you have to get at practice, whether they're college students or young people. And the only thing that came out of the policy landscape in the last decade was the Common Core, and you haven't asked about that. So the Common Core, while it is about academic standards, or was, is actually a different strategy than everything else we've seen. And it might be worth talking about what what is it about it that would have been different or would be different, and why is it that it went awry or is going awry. And that is actually not quite the same thing as setting standards, because it was an effort to interrupt the completely non-systemic nature of our educational so-called system in which states, and we see this now under the Every Student Succeeds Act, back to you know more and more emphasis on local control and individual and local decision making, which in the history of our country since the 1840s has been a tension where on one hand we want a common school system, on the other hand we want every community and every parent to have a voice, and then we're surprised when we have educational inequality that magnifies over time. The Common Core was an effort to say the only way toward this would be for states to agree on a set of academic learning outcomes that students should achieve and then be able to mobilize textbook companies and teacher education and professional development in a way that we could operate at scale in a way that we don't. But it would be interesting to unpack why that, which wasn't principally, until, until Race to the Top, wasn't principally a standards-based reform policy, mm -hmm. what made it start to have the trouble it's having. And it's instructive because it's the thing that's so, so just fundamentally and paradigmatically American about us, about what makes it so difficult for us to try to actually improve the quality of what young people get. And I'm gonna keep coming back to that because when I became a teacher in 1974, this nation's population was 80% white. And of the students in this country, a very small fraction spoke languages other than English in the home. And right now, as of 2011, I think most of you know, over half the children born in this country are black or brown. And the numbers of students who speak multiple languages has rapidly increasing. So what that means to actually realize the promise of building a set of schools in this country that could build a citizenry, I think the last couple of weeks make that more evident than ever, the importance of us doing that. It'd be worth talking about the one strategy we saw in the last two decades that attempted to renew our commitment to something in common uh, with an honoring of diversity and seems to have had so much trouble. And I think it might be interesting to, to yeah. talk about that. Well, it is interesting because this is obviously a, a, a policy that uh, President Trump has repeatedly vowed to repeal. Uh, on the other hand, whether you adopt the Common Core standards or within the control of states, not the federal government, and in most places they've been in place for three years or more and seem to be growing in acceptance and in popularity, at least among uh, teachers and students so, and parents. So, um, if I can jump in on that, I, I'll, I'll give two perspectives on actually your your question, which I think is an interesting question. It's actually a very interesting, like, what happened with that kind of question? So, one, from a kind of political analysis, and two, analysis as a uh, I'm going to say it's anecdotal, but it's a little more widespread. Uh, as a father of kids who have grown up <laughs> in the District of Columbia public schools, experiencing the kind of transition at Common Core. So first, the political analysis. I think, um, and this is my own uh, point of view, it would be interesting to see what you think about this. You've never talked about this particular issue. Um, is that uh, I think an unfortunate political thing happened when the Obama administration came into office. They, uh, Common Core was going along. It was being developed, it was being adopted by states. Uh, they entered into the political conversation uh, around support for Common Core and the ideology behind it. And normally that probably would have been fine, but it became like a galvanizing kind of issue. If you didn't like Obama, all of a sudden now you didn't like Common Core. Uh, and and it, it, frankly, the states were going along just fine without kind of federal involvement in it, mostly political. 
And so I, I think it was a miscalculation by the Obama administration to kind of wade into the politics of that by showing support for it when it was, it didn't need the support to thrive. Um, secondly, this is now transferring to my uh, kind of parent hat here. Um, uh, the Common Core was not well explained to parents. It was not well explained to kind of even, and uh, uh, I'm a you know, pretty astute parent at good parent teacher conferences, care about what kids are doing, sit around the dinner table with them, help them with their homework. Although my son's high school homework is starting to get a little complicated. Um, but uh, it, the Common Core transition wasn't explained well. It wasn't digested well. You had forums you could go to. It got very academic very quickly. And this is for someone that actually knows something about standards and has read about it. Parents were confused by it. It seemed mysterious. It was different. It was new. Uh, it, it was hard to grasp for them. So I, I almost wonder if there was two kind of moments in, in or the, I think there were two moments, one, a political misstep, and two, a lack of communication about what it was. And do you have, I'm sorry, David, yeah. Al Alex, do you have a prediction for what's going to happen under President Trump with respect to the Common Core? I, th I think, David, maybe in a better position to answer this, but uh, I think that uh, the anti-Common Core rhetoric from coming from the Trump administration will largely be more rhetoric. I, I wonder when it comes down to saying what states can do. If a state really wants to have the Common Core, I don't know why the federal government would tell them they could not. And that's kind of the last step. I think David's legislation with ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, did a good job of saying, hey, you don't have to adopt anything you don't want to. If you want to do Common Core, great. You want to do something else, you do that too, in terms of standards. But I, I don't know why a Trump administration would say you can't do Common Core. I, I sure, I, I'll answer that la first, because it's sure. right there. I think that he should declare victory and go home. Hmm. He's, you know, common with the Every Student Succeeds Act, it's against, it would be against the law for him to prohibit states from adopting Common Core. Um, but he's certainly made his case, and many states are moving away to, to other things. And so instead of spending a lot of time trying to kill the Common Core or tell states what to do about their standards, he should follow the, the Every Student Succeeds Act and say, states, it's up to you. You have to have standards, um, but it's up to you what those standards are. Going to the, to the beginning, though, I think the, I agree with a lot of what Alex said. I think part of the problem is kind of the, the coercive nature of the federal government. Lamar likes to tell a story when he was governor, when he was in his first term, he had to place a prison in Tennessee. And this was a long time ago, and it was always, nobody really ever wants a prison in their community. So he went around to every mayor and every county mayor and, and city mayor and said, okay, I, I, need a, I need a place of prison. Can I put it here? And they all said no. And then the next year, the legislature said, you know, geez, Lamar, you haven't placed the prison. We really need you to put the prison somewhere. So he said, okay, here's an idea. And he, at his state of the state address, said, I've got a place of prison. Who wants to compete for it? And suddenly everybody wanted it. And so Common Core is a lot the same way. States, it, it started before the Obama administration. It was an organization between the, the National Governance Association mm -hmm. and the chief state school officers and Achieve. And they were working together and trying to figure it out. And there was a kind of a small group of states that were going to do it. And then a little bit of a larger group that said, okay, if you get it figured out, we'll definitely do it. But then Race to the Top comes in with its you know, $5 billion and competitive grants to states and it was in the, in the height of the deepest uh, recession that we've had since the Great Depression, so everybody was kind of desperate for money. And then the uh, Secretary's waivers on kind of getting away from No Child Left Behind. And between the race to the top and the waivers, it became coercive. It became essentially a federal requirement that you had to adopt Common Core. And it wasn't, it didn't, they didn't explicitly say that, but it was essentially an effect, a, a mandate. And so it became hated. And conveniently then, Every problem that you could, you could envision could be blamed on Common Core. You don't like your teacher evaluation system because it was rushed and you have to, uh, have to apply to these standards and these tests that you've never used. Well, it's Common Core. The, your kid doesn't do well in the test. Well, it's Common Core. The, you know, the dog didn't eat their homework. It's Common Core. And so Common Core became this huge political albatross for, uh, for people around the country. And, it was, and, and then from a Republican perspective, it was Obama made us do it. And so every, every Republican governor in, in the, or almost every Republican governor in the country was saying, you know, 
we were doing pretty well on our own trying to figure out what our standards mm. should look like. But now you're telling me that it has to be this specific thing. I don't like that. I don't want that. And you're, you know, you, the federal government, are a junior partner in the financing of my education system. You, you give me about, your Title I is about 3%. Overall, K-12 spending from the federal government is about 10%. And now you're telling me what my standards have to look like, that I have to have a teacher evaluation system, that I have to have these annual tests, that I have to have uh, a way to punish schools that don't do well this way, your specific way. And governors and, and, and folks in the states are sitting there saying, well, who the heck are you? The only other organization that we know that operates like that is the mafia. The junior partner tells the big partner everything that they have to do. So it just became kind of this albatross of angst and negativity. So uh, I will resist the urge to quibble with the Obama uh, record and focus. I want to focus a little bit on where we are <coughs> now. So we've had, you know, the Common Core in place for at least three years. Uh, the transition problems, uh, from what I have seen, seem to be uh, uh, moving past it. Teachers understand mm -hmm. it better. Parents understand mm -hmm. it better. And we have a system now places. where... Uh, most states have uh, shared academic expectations that are significantly more rigorous and more challenging than what they had uh, eight years ago. So I guess the question is, uh, is this not an enduring legacy of the last couple mm -hmm. of years of federal education policy? Or, and uh, isn't the nation better off now that we are going to have these more rigorous standards that are probably going to continue to exist in a critical mass of states at least. I think the translation of Common Core into rigorous academic standards is a little bit of a fallacy. That's not its main point. Um, it's not the Common Core, for all of the rhetoric about it, is not that dramatically different from what we taught at any other moment. I mean, I think sometimes this doesn't get into the weeds enough. We're talking about at what grade level kids should learn to understand fractions as numbers on the number line. This is not a politically dicey topic. Let's get real about this. But if you're a teacher educator and you want to prepare teachers to teach in this country, you have no idea at what grade level they're going to teach what or with what materials. And then we're surprised we can't build a coherent teacher education system which means that the professionals who enter schools are way underprepared for teaching real children real content. That's what this is about, and it became a highly politicized conversation with a mm -hmm. lot of imagination about what this was about. I taught the only person on the panel who taught for a long time, and the standards that we taught in 1970s were not so dramatically different from your perspective in this room than what the Common Core does. What the Common Core attempted to do was to say that the standards shouldn't be different in Idaho than they are in Michigan and Mississippi. Why would kids need to learn fractions at a different age in Mississippi than they need to learn them in Detroit? That doesn't make any sense. The ways you might actually work with students to help them learn fractions, yeah, you would need to adapt that to who your learners are, and that takes skill of teaching. So every time we try to do this and don't worry about the teachers who would have to learn to teach this stuff really well, mm -hmm. complex academic work to all kids, and we don't do teacher education and we rush, it's not surprising. So this was extremely rushed. We think we're going to take a set of standards and put them in all schools at all grade levels overnight. That's a completely a uh, crazy way of thinking that you would actually change carefully what academic instruction and learning look like. You know, would we really have the patience in this country ever to say we're going to begin with two or three grade levels, help all the teachers learn to teach that extremely well to children who speak multiple languages, to children who are very different from them? One problem we haven't mentioned is the huge gap between who the teachers are and who the kids are in this country, hugely different demographically. As I said a moment ago, by far the majority of children are approaching being children who are not white children. They're black children, they're brown children, they're children who are from many parts of the world, multiple ethnicities, but the teachers in this country are almost 90% white women. So white and some of them women, most of them women, not white women, but most of them white. <laughs> and then we don't have a teacher education system that either creates the way of recruiting people into it or prepares people for that. And we talk about these sort of political arguments. This is not about the kids. This is not a conversation about children. It just stays at a level that doesn't enable us to actually think, what would it look like to get much better academic instruction in every school, in Detroit, in Gross Point, in, you know, up in the Upper Peninsula? We don't talk about that. And if you visited those schools, you'd be probably quite surprised at seeing how extremely different the opportunities to learning are. And they won't change until we actually deal with the quality of teaching. And I can tell you that the research on merit pay doesn't show us that it improves teaching. 
that doesn't show us that it improves teaching. So the only way to improve a practice is to have opportunities to learn to do it and to be coached and helped to learn to do it. There isn't a royal road around that. And I think as long as we pretend that there is, we will have decade after decade of a version of the same conversation. Do you guys want to get in again? Yeah, I think, I think one important thing about the standards issue is, I mean, I agree with you that there were states that had uh, very top-notch and, and rigorous standards. There are plenty of states that did not, did not expect a lot of their kids. So I, I, I certainly agree that the Common Core uh, didn't necessarily, for the top-notch states, increase rigor of what we demand of our kids. But, a lot to, but in lots of places in this country, it did. And it, and it required states to really more hope the ones that wanted to join in, at least, uh, decide to holistically really think about, all right, what actually are we expecting of our children? Why is state X unable to attract businesses and uh, uh, other kind of workforce uh, kind of uh, solutions because, uh, you know, if, if we're not educating our kids to the, to the <coughs> level of uh, what they should be educated to. So I, there was a lack of uniformity, yes, but for places that were lower down the spectrum, Common Core would, you know, and has produced a more rigorous uh, set of expectations from kids. And so one. Why? Why one, is returning to the states going to help us then right now? Hold on, hold on one second. One, I'll get to that in just two seconds. Okay. One real quick thing I just have to say, I'm trying to not litigate the past. But the Obama administration did not require the adoption of Common Core. I would disagree right. with my friend here that it was a requirement. The political rhetoric around it and the discussion certainly encouraged the view that Common Core was a good thing. And that's where I argue there was a political misstep made by two owning that brand, something that the states were doing very well at uh, and and kind of proceeding along. The Obama administration did not need to interject itself into mm -hmm. that conversation. So we might differ on the requirement aspect. I think I, we're saying the same thing on the other aspect. I think I was pretty careful in saying that, in effect, it was a requirement because You said of, requirement. All right. I, in, I, in I want to, uh, <laughs> I have a strong opinion about this myself, but I want to, I want to bring sure. us back into uh, 2017. Yes, sir. So, Deborah, you brought up the issue of teacher That's preparation, awesome. and that is also um, an important reform that the Obama administration recently adopted by regulation. Mm -hmm. And that regulation happens to be uh, one that Congress could quickly overturn because of its recency. So I wondered what you thought the prospects were of that rule, and if Congress does quickly invalidate that regulation, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, notice that in the, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the teacher preparation regulation, they follow the same theme. So the theme is we must have a lot of bad programs, just like we must have a lot of bad teachers. So if we set requirements on programs, just as we did in the teacher evaluation era or in standard-based reform, and then we close programs that are not good or withhold funding from them, somehow the system will improve. It's a, it's a punitive strategy rather than one that would say, we actually have a looming teacher shortage uh, we will probably see in the next five years more and more people going into classrooms who have not not just no preparation, but ne negative preparation, who will have to be filling classrooms. Mm -hmm. And no one is paying attention to this. It's not a very good moment to be thinking about how you punish teacher preparation programs. It's an ideal moment for thinking how we ensure that the quality of beginning teaching is at a level that it hasn't ever been before. And that is an incredibly challenging moment to make that argument, and yet, in the schools where we have the lowest income students and the highest concentration of black and brown children, we have the, also the greatest distribution of incredibly early career teachers who are underprepared for the work and who leave rapidly. And we put cycles of those through these schools. So what we actually need right now is a policy that would support raising the quality of beginning teaching and ensuring the distribution of good teaching to schools in which we have children who really deserve that teaching. But instead what we have is a policy like many of our others that is primarily one of regulating and somehow punishing bad programs. That isn't an improvement strategy. And I'll sort of keep coming back to how can the federal government leverage policy that can build improvements in practice and specifically improvements for children and so if you were in charge of federal policy on teacher preparation, what would you do to try and embed those practices into teacher prep programs? Are you talking about additional funding? Would you put additional requirements on those programs? What, what is your, or do you think the federal government should just get out of the way on the, on a, 
on a policy level, what is your theory well, I, of change? I, very likely. I mean, states control teacher preparation because they license mm -hmm. teachers. So just as with the curriculum for K-12 K students, you have a similar challenge, which is states would have to somehow come together on what it would mean to do professional education better, what licensure would look like. We have 50 different systems of teacher licensure. Mm -hmm. So some incentives for there to be more commonality about what beginning teaching needs, what the standard for that needs to be like, and support for people, first of all, to enter, to recruit a greater diversity of people into the workforce, and then to improve the quality of beginning teaching, you'd have to supply funding that helps to create common common curriculum in some sense for a profession that we've never had. Wouldn't be that difficult to think about the things that all beginning teachers need to know how to do and ensure that programs of many different types had the materials and the resources to ensure that people who are willing to teach our nation's children actually got adequate preparation to begin doing that work. But that would be a primarily different. primarily state led. Maybe some federal so some coalitions of states. Convening. Well, yeah. coalitions of states and incentives for states to team up to do that work. Mm -hmm. As long as we have so many different systems in a such a fragmented educational non-system, it's very unlikely that we can get the improvement we need. Okay. I think on the uh, teacher prep regs, those are one of the early targets for the new Congress to overturn the regulation and send it for a, a signature to overturn it. The kind of the, one of the main drivers for, for our opposition to the regulations is that it, in effect, mandates a teacher evaluation system on the states. And we, as much as Lamar thinks that that's a great thing to do, he would not want to coerce it. Uh, he doesn't think that it's the federal government's role. And the, this regulation is kind of a, a yet another example of huge overreach of reading what the statute says and then deciding the policies that they want to implement. So it's, it's one that will be overturned relatively quickly as soon as we can get through the process. David, I wonder if you could handicap two other pieces of legislation for us. One is um, House Republicans have proposed a number of times a budget blueprint that calls for cutting uh, Pell Grant scholarships for college students. Mm -hmm. And there have been some press reports that um, uh, congressional Republicans intend to pursue that through the reconciliation procedure, which would mean Democrats couldn't filibuster it. Um, and then secondly, there have been, sort of in a very different sphere, there have been bipartisan talks at least happening in the Senate about some improvements to the Higher Education Act that both parties could agree to. Um, so do you think that uh, uh, reconciliation, including changes, potential cuts to the Pell Grants, is something that is likely to happen? And do you think that a bipartisan higher education bill is likely to happen? Sure. Uh, we're off the record, right? Uh, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, the, I think getting the Senate to agree to any type of significant cuts to the Pell Grant would be difficult, even with a Republican majority. Um, I think that you know there's there's always room for improvement in the administration of the program, um, making sure that the that the right students get it, um, and that it, that it's used for the right purposes. But I, I I don't I don't envision much success in that. Um, I don't have an election certificate, so I could be wrong. But it would be, I think, difficult to get uh, even a simple majority to do anything that has a significant cut to the Pell Grant. I think it's a, in an, kind of, as we look at the Republican agenda for an, an opportunity society and giving people a, a, a way up the economic ladder, the Pell Grant is, is a pretty successful uh, program. Um, on a bipartisan higher education, I think that there is there is a lot of room for it. A lot depends on, um, you know, you know hubris and humility. Um, if if Republicans have a lot of arrogance at the beginning of, of the new Congress and alienate all of the Democrats, um, it's really hard to get to sixty. So I think that you know we need to be um, we as you know as a Republican staff director um, working for a, a boss who is probably one of the. I can say this because I work for him, one of the better legislators in mm -hmm. the Congress. Um, I think that you know we are very interested in a, in a bipartisan higher education reauthorization, and I think what that means is both sides have to kind of accept what the limits are. That you know nobody nobody ever goes into a negotiation and gets 100% of what they want. So you know free college not going to happen. Um, gutting the Pell Grant program not going to happen. So you take kind of those two extremes. If you know. If, 
if Patty Murray has a list of things that she wants to accomplish and Lamar Alexander has a list of things that he wants to accomplish, you know, if both of them say, okay, 80% of that list is good enough or 60% of that list is good enough um, and kind of build our expectations around what we can get to 60 votes for is, is a very successful strategy. And, and Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray have great success in doing that on, mm -hmm. in all sorts of areas, education, healthcare, uh, appropriations. Patty Murray saved the saved the country twice with budget deals um, with Paul Ryan. Um, she knows how to negotiate and to, to be um, responsible in her expectations and Lamar knows how to be responsible. And I think a, a reauthorization package that could get to 60 would, would look at a, a wide variety of things. We haven't reauthorized the Higher Education Act since 2007. There's a lot of kind of subterranean policy that don't, people don't really talk a lot about, but needs to happen. A reauthorization of the of Title III, the historically black colleges and universities, minority serving institutions, uh, Hispanic serving institutions, things like that. Um, you've got the teacher prep program that, that you know, the regulations are, are, are horrible. The statute is, is kind of bad. Um, it was kind of very unrealistic in 2007. It's one of the reasons why Lamar voted against it the last time. So we can reshape that. And then kind of the, the, some of the larger questions of accountability and, and how, do you, how do we know what schools are out there that are offering good quality? The, you know, our kind of our, I guess I'm at an institution of higher education, so I should say our theory of action is that it's the higher education is a marketplace where you've got a very competitive environment, lots of, lots of schools, 6,000 different providers. Students get a voucher, a Pell Grant, and a student loan that they can take to the institution of their choice. And so there's a lot of market forces there that allow for competition. And the, the, one of the federal roles is ensuring that the marketplace is fair and that it's effective and that the, the individual, the student, the parent is well informed about the choices that they're making and that those choices are as they are being represented. So I think that if we can look at accountability in a way that gets us to kind of a, you know, a fair examination across the board of what's going on in those schools, there's a lot of bipartisanship already in different bills that are out there of mm -hmm. what is it that you should be looking at. And it's, it's very complex, it's very hard, but if, you know, if two people can do it, it'd be Lamar and Patty. So I, I'm pretty optimistic about a higher ed reauthorization. Alex, I'm gonna give you the last bit of handicapping and then we'll ask Joe and Anna to help us with questions from the audience. Uh, but my questions for you would be uh, free college, so a related proposal from President Obama, obviously a centerpiece of Se Secretary Clinton's campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, dead for now, or what is the route forward for that? And then secondly, we haven't talked at all about young children. Mm -hmm. President Obama obviously had proposed universal preschool, big expansion in child care subsidies. Mm -hmm. Is there a route forward for investing more in the uh, children before they reach elementary school? So I, I think for advocates of free college, whatever that meant to different people, um, uh, you'd have to say the odds are way down on that going uh, somewhere. Uh, it was a major component of the Clinton campaign. She obviously didn't get elected. Um, so I, I just can't imagine that gets a lot of traction uh, in a um, in a legislative vehicle that is going somewhere. I have no doubt that people will propose it. It'll probably be a point of conversation in your committee. Uh, Senator Sanders, for instance, is a member of the HELP Committee, and he'll be likely to bring up a proposal that was very near and dear to his heart when he yeah. ran on it. And that was certainly an, an element of debt free or free, depending on your point of view. So, but I have to think the odds of that going somewhere are, are, are small at best. On child care, I think it's a, a different matter. Um, you have had the president elect and his uh, family of advisors essentially talk about uh, um, talk about uh, child care and the needs out there and what uh, at least some of their visions are to help uh, families with child care expenses. I, I don't know if you're looking at, my initial read of it is, I don't know if you're looking at a large kind of universal-based program that, that President Obama uh, proposed, uh, that Secretary Clinton was also a fan of. I, I, I don't see that sort of approach. I do see at least initially some conversations happening about what can we do to more help, uh, to help uh, parents more with child care expenses. I, I do think that's at least got some chance out there. Um, but TBD, because we don't know a lot of the policy details, how it would be paid for and what the actual proposals would be. Okay, we uh, are a little late getting to the audience questions, so uh, Anna and Joe, over to you guys. Hello, oh, there we go. Um, so 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Shea. I am a first year BA student in the Ford School. Um, contrary to what Dean Collins said at the beginning of this talk, we do not get extra credit from being here. Uh, we, are, we are just two students who love being in Professor Qual's class. Uh, and with that being said, we'll, we'll tee it off with the first audience question. Um, and this is to all three of you. Uh, what is the role of education in ensuring that Americans are not living in the, quote, echo chambers and bubbles that contribute to the ideological divisions evident in the results of the election? Deborah, you want to? Well, I was thinking about that, that we've managed to get this far in the conversation and never mentioned what we've seen about or had reinforced for us about what a divided country we're living in. And we haven't mentioned we haven't mentioned the fact that our schools are more segregated than they were 50 years ago and that <laughs> income inequality is much greater than it was 40 or 50 years ago, that divisions in our country have widened, and that many of the policies we're hearing about will serve only to widen those gaps. So vouchers, for example, um, no, talking carefully about what the effects will that be on different groups of people in our society. What does it take to actually avail yourself of different schools? How do you get your kid to that school? All of these things that will likely actually separate, or the idea of returning much more to states and to local districts to control what kids learn is a step toward more division and more separation. Um, not to mention the fact that, you know, the founders of common schools, for all of their flaws and for all of the fact that we weren't educating anywhere close to all children in those days, did have the image that schools could function to help to build some kind of a democracy together. And mm -hmm. what that will mean for us to re-seize that in an era of a much more diverse society than we ever had means there's an enormous imperative for public schools. And I think it's kind of amazing that we got this far in the conversation without talking about those goals of schooling and how really pressing they are at this point. Uh, Al Shanker, who, former head of the AFT, said that the role of the public school was originally to teach immigrant children English and what it means to be an American in the hopes that they would go home and teach their parents the same thing. And I think that the, the civic mission of the school changes a lot depending on the, the community that you're in, but that's kind of the core of it. Teach people what it, what it means to be an American, what it means to be part of this very diverse, very uh, robust society. I think the, the, the breakdown that we've seen in the past decade or two or three is is tough to overcome. I think we, especially with with uh, with social media and the internet, we self-select our news now. We we Republicans read their sites, Democrats read their sites, and they don't cross. And uh, it's it's very rare for people to read each other's sides. And the the TV and the and the cable stations all have started to self-select. And there there's not there's not much uh, dispassionate kind of discussion about truth and facts and objectiveness. I was reading an article this morning on the plane about the, you know, the, the media networks as they have these panels like this and they intermingle an opinion person with a journalist and it becomes, people become totally inured to what it is that they're saying because they just assume that everybody is an opinion person so there's no discussion about facts. It's, it's tough, I don't, it's a, it's a, that's a good question. I think the, it's, it's something that we have to challenge ourselves to try and figure out how do we, how do we understand where each other is coming from? What are what are the what are the where are the divides? Where are the the truths? You know, the the average Trump voter probably has more in common with the average Sanders voter than they do with the average Clinton or Jeb Bush voter. And so there's there are these kind of weird crossovers on the you know at at the fringes that we don't really we we don't really understand. And I think that it's it's a it's an ongoing you know the American experiment is ongoing. I think we have, we have a lot of work to do to try and figure out how to bring some commonality. Schools obviously have a, an important role to play, especially with younger children, pre-college children, in terms of uh, helping them, uh, to David's point, you know, educating uh, kids about the civic kind of responsibilities of citizenship and, and kind of how our government works, and hopefully encouraging um, all children uh, uh, in, in our schools to really think about diverse Viewpoints. I mean, I, Dave and I were just talking about this earlier today, actually, uh, about how we consume news from different uh, areas. And, you know, where I might consume news impacts what I think, and where he might consume news impacts what he thinks. And lots of people do that now. And, you know, school, though, is one place where everybody, you know, if you're thinking about a classroom and, 
and kids are being taught by a teacher or teachers are getting one form of news or information from, and hopefully that can encourage them to look at a broad set of uh, kind of things and understand what one person's saying and another person's saying. Hello, um, I'm Anna Strzic. I'm pursuing a joint master's in public policy in higher education, and I'm in James Gall's class now. Um, so this is an audience question. If this administration does turn the bulk of the decision-making of policy over to Congress, how much action can we expect to see at the federal level in education policy, especially with a fairly evenly divided Senate? How might this impact states' education budget allocations? I wouldn't expect to see any significant increases in uh, education spending. Um, I think you're, you know, we're, we're at a point with you know, significant debt and uh, difficulty in passing any increases in, in Congress. You know, you, maybe a, a reshuffling of the deck uh, of what we have, but I wouldn't expect to see any increases. But I, I do think that we have an opportunity to do some important things in higher education and an evenly divided Congress in some ways might make it a little bit easier because we have to listen to each other and work together mm -hmm. to get to 60. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know when, we, when, when one party has too many votes, they don't listen to the other side. And, or they, they, we spend our time trying to pick off a couple um, and who, you know, who are our easiest targets. And you know, for the Republicans, it's, you know, okay, let's go to you know, this state that's potentially a Republican state or this state. And the Democrats, you know, go to you know some of the, the more moderate uh, members of the caucus, and that doesn't build much consensus. But the, the the beauty of the design of the Senate in in needing 60 votes to to move legislation forward is that it does foster consensus. It brings people together. So I think an evenly divided Congress makes it more likely that you know we'll we'll move further further and further away from our our fringes to get to that 60 vote. Um, okay, so the next question is, who do you think will benefit from education policies under a Trump administration? Who, 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 was that? who will benefit from the Trump administration? I, I really think that's, um, that remains to be seen. You know, the, from the Trump administration, there's not a detailed set of education policies. And I, I think I agree with David that, you know, a lot of what it looks like right now is that Congress, especially Senator Alexander and, and um, very likely incoming chair Virginia Fox from uh, North Carolina will probably be tone setters in terms of what, where at least federal education policy goes. Um, you know, as time goes on and the Trump administration starts articulating points of view, I think we can make more of a decision. But I think it's too early to jump and immediately assume it'll be bad for this group or good for this group. I, I think purely from the Trump side of things, we haven't seen a lot of details yet. I, don't. Oh, I think that's fair. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I have much else to add. I, I could say something sarcastic like all of us because we're going to make America great again. And this next one comes from Twitter and it's for you, David. Who would be the right students for a Pell Grant? Who would be the right students? I think it's uh, low income first time students are the, the primary focus. Um, I think the, the question that we struggle with as, as Congress is how far up the income scale do you go to, to get to it the, with college costs so high. Um, the, the cutoff now is, is low, but the resource, you know, it's, Pell Grant is 36 billion roughly a year. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of money. So it's, you know, for every, I think for every, there's like all these weird formulas, like for every $100 that you increase the Pell Grant, that costs $10 billion, or a billion dollars, sorry. For every $100, it's a billion, is that roughly it's, right? It's, it's, I don't know, I think it's between 500 million and a billion. Yeah, yeah. and so, you know, so those, those costs matter a lot. Um, and I think what, what we've been trying to do is how do, we, how do we get more people to apply for the FAFSA, or apply, use the FAFSA, how do we simplify it so that it's not a deterrent? Um, and then how do we get, how do we get more students uh, the aid that they need? And the question is how, how high up the scale can you go is based on how much resources you have. Is there an appropriate policy fix for the crisis in higher education remediation is the next question. Hmm. Good question. Probably, 
just well, it would mean investing more carefully in, in what happens before college. So the remediation problem comes from the fact that we so unevenly educate our children. And I, I do want to say that this conversation has turned more to talking about the particular people in office. And I want to point out that the comments that I made earlier about where we've failed to actually make a difference for young people cut across Republican and Democratic mm -hmm. administrations. Mm -hmm. I think that as policy makers and policy systems, we haven't understood that we can't make a difference for people heading to college without appropriate uh, opportunities to learn mathematics or whatever it is that leads them to remediation or to learn enough to read so that they're eligible for college. We haven't done that across either administration or across any of the last several because we keep manipulating levers that don't actually make a difference in the classroom. And the only way to do that, I know that I'm saying this over and over, but it's interesting that we don't create policies that actually change instruction. And you can't change instruction when you're manipulating levers that are very far from it. And as you keep changing who the decision makers are, they just keep making decisions that are very, very similar. There are more similarities across the last 30 years than there are differences. And I think one of the, uh, well, I, I would agree on, I agree on that, and I think one of the bigger challenges we're seeing uh, more and more, especially with some of the clients we work with, um, in terms of uh, what they're doing in, this, in the institutional higher education space is returning adults. And the fact that you know if you're 30 or 40 or 45, uh, or 50 and, and trying to return and get a credential or a degree, uh, you know, what you learned in high school was interesting, but it was a long time ago, and that system, you know, may or may not have served you well at that time, but uh, in addition to students that are coming out of high school and entering to your schools or for your schools, whatever they might be doing, the remedial needs there, you do have needs among a growing adult population uh, to benefit from post-secondary education, and, and that's where, unfortunately, it really comes to roost on the higher education uh, kind of system because that's where those students encounter the first like oh I need to take what level of remedial math to kind of do this well that you know I, I was in high school 20 years ago I you know what what else do you do for that individual until they encounter the system I think it's a real challenge we're not we're not answering the question I think of appropriate uh, that's that's a I don't know if I have a good answer immediately for that no, I don't. I don't know that there's a there's a good answer. I think there's a lot of conversation about it. It's a, it is a big driver of cost. Uh, we we, you know, I would consider it to be a waste of money because, we, these are students that should have gotten that education in the first place. So why are we then using Pell Grant money to to spend it in higher education? Uh, it seems you know very shameful. Um, I think that you know you're seeing governors really start to challenge it uh, and try and figure out how to address these these questions. Um, but I don't know that there's any um, any magic bullet right now. The next question is, what sort of reforms have been shown to raise salaries of low-paid teachers in the poorest corners of this country? I can't really hear what she said. She said what kind of um, what policies affect teacher quality, especially in rural and low-paid? I think especially it's pay, right? Increasing pay, right? Yes. So yeah. we know from the research on teacher pay that what's sometimes called location-based pay can work. You can sometimes keep people in an area where they're teaching. It doesn't work particularly well to attract people to areas of teaching. Um, and again, pay, while it's extremely important and no one would want to say that it's not, that the, there's no great secret to this, that preparing people to do the work with young people that will help people thrive is what keeps people in the classroom. And when they fail to be able to do that, and they're operating in with incredibly punitive environments, they leave. And they primarily leave the places where kids particularly need good teaching. So what we get is a cycle of reproduction of a grossly unequal society, because we don't create our schools with enough strength to actually intervene on that, even though we know from research that very skillful teaching can make a dramatic difference for children across lots of different outside of school environments, but we don't choose to do that. The next question is, doesn't the fact that both the SAT and the ACT are aligning with Common Core make the Common Core discussion a semantic one? I'm going to say again, the Common Core is not some dramatically different set of things um, in schools. Uh, what it does, to be rather precise, is it adds a bit more um, emphasis on mathematical practice, that is, reasoning about mathematics, which I think anybody can see we haven't done terrifically well over the last 50 years in this country, and it increases emphasis on expository text and reading more of a wider range of texts and informational text. And 
other than that, if you if you actually read what's in the Common Core, it's not going to strike you as some huge difference. So it's not terribly surprising that it would be lined up with what we want people to know when they go to college. I mean, obviously, uh, two of the uh, larger um, college um, testing-based companies are going to look to see what states are adopting uh, as part of their own set of standards. And you know, by far, Common Core is one of the even today is one of the more um, unifying kind of forces out there and what uh, expectations uh, we have of our children. So it would make sense that's the case. Is it, 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 I don't know if that one data point by itself makes the Common Core kind of conversation uh, semantic. I, I think for all of the um, concern uh, uh, from people on both sides of the spectrum uh, and both sides of the Common Core issue that's been voiced out there, Common Core is still in a lot of states and being utilized by a lot of states. Uh, you know, certainly some have renamed things and dropped out, and, and that's going to happen, and, and it's been shown to happen. But um, I, I think largely Common Core seems to be, for right now, here to stay. I mean, uh, we'll see how history judges it 5, 10, 15 years down the road. But I, I don't know if that one thing makes it semantic in my point of view. I don't know. Well, I think it's... it's I think standards are here to stay, and I think that, mm -hmm. as Professor Ross has pointed out, the DNA of all the standards are relatively the same. There's minuscule differences on the on the edges. Um, this next question comes to us from Twitter. Will teacher preparation regulations be one of the first to go under the new administration, and how might this affect Teach for America? What be the first to go? Teacher prep. Well, teacher prep first how does, to go. How does it, we've talked about how the teacher prep role is likely to be oh. on the chopping block. How does that affect the teacher prep? Those, those regulations are about teacher preparation programs. Um, the biggest problem we face right now that we've not mentioned is an approximately 40% decline across types of programs, including the alternative programs of people even being willing to be teachers. So at the same moment we're seeing a big retirement bulge, we're seeing a far fewer number of people going into teaching. So mm -hmm. again, these will affect programs and we'll perhaps have fewer programs if, if these even stick, which is likely sure. it won't. But meanwhile, we won't have actually done, put to work the research on instruction that we've done over the last 30 years to make sure that the people who are ready, that we can recruit people to teaching and prepare them. So we need a policy that actually can support forward motion. These regulations don't do much for that one way or the other. Yeah, I think, as I said earlier, these regulations will be in the in the first tranche of, uh, of regulations that go away. I don't know that they directly that directly affects negatively or, or positively Teach for America, but I think um, I, I think that Teach for America is one element of a, a teacher recruitment system. It's not the only solution. It's part of the solution. So I think that the more that you get away from kind of the uh, top-down system of trying to tell states what to do about their teacher recruitment, Maybe that helps Teach for America a little bit. Uh, with apologies to you guys, I'm going to hijack and uh, claim the right to ask the last question. I don't know if I actually have that right or not. But I'm interested in um, the difference in perspective here between policy and practice. And Deborah keeps uh, reminding us that, in her view, we, the policymakers, both Republican and Democratic, mm -hmm. are pulling on the wrong lever. And I guess, you know, from the perspective of federal policymakers, you see you know, large sums of money going to schools and to colleges without achieving the results uh, that policymakers would like to see. So um, uh, if the goal is to improve practice inside the classroom, what is it that federal policymakers can or should be doing to support the types of efforts that you're talking about? Um, or is it something that this is just a problem that doesn't really have a federal solution to it? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I can start. I think that the it, I don't know that there's much of a federal solution. We're you know we're policy skeptics. We think that the federal government is not very smart, very wise, very all knowing. I think what the federal government can do is uh, use use Title One and, and other programs to to help states address low income and 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 give districts extra money to to help address poverty in in their in their in their areas. I think that we can also spend more on research to identify things that work, things that don't work, um, and make that available to, to teachers and, and local policymakers. I think, you know, our view is that the, the federal government is not a great uh, 
a great place to look to to help solve what's going on in your classroom, that more of those solutions need to be local, that the feds uh, can help, but not much. I think a dilemma is that with gross inequality in this country, the tension between local control and more central or federal control is a genuine tension, so I think that your question is a really good question. I think that the struggle that would make a difference would be to design ways of linking research on teaching and mm -hmm. research on learning together with teacher education that would actually improve the quality of what people learn and not be always looking to punish programs, but instead to build up the resources, the curriculum, the kinds of assessments that are formative that help to produce good beginning teachers and help to improve teachers in the classroom. There are ways to use federal funds to do that. We've seen that with other kinds of funding. So it doesn't have to be taking over the control of states. It can be understanding that we're talking about prof a profession. I mean, the re medical residencies in this country that doctors um, use to become good doctors are paid for a very large fraction of that by the federal mm -hmm. money. Of course, it's a much smaller scale profession, but we have different strategies for professions we really care about their practice, and it's time for us to do use federal funding to do that when the clients are children, particularly uh, children who have been further put at risk by the lack of our ability to leverage policy to improve the quality. Alex, do you want the last word? No, I, I agree with both my colleagues here. I don't <laughs> Wow, the first time for everything. A very successful lobbyist. Uh, all right, it is in my duty to uh, adjourn us not too late. I want to thank the audience uh, for excellent questions. I want to thank uh, Joe and Anna for helping convene it, and of course our panelists uh, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.